Well, I guess on that note, let's talk about sports. Dun, 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 dun. Do, 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 do. Hey, everyone, I'm your friend Joseph Craven here on the Every Now and Again Pessimist. I think that's the name of the, the series at this point in time. It's just whenever I can find the time to actually record a podcast, Pessimist, it's not really weekly anymore. But I'm glad to be here talking about the uh, the Mississippi State Bulldogs, winners of five straight in basketball. <laughs> Winners of some baseball games lately, um, three in a row. Uh, I don't know. I guess that I didn't keep up with the – well, I was keeping up with the Southeastern Louisiana game that happened on the night that we are recording. Um, but I know there was possible weather coming in, and I'll be honest with you, I got home and ate a pizza and then haven't really checked back in on it. So we'll figure that out when we get there. But I'm joined by Gray Barnes, Gray Howard Things in the Eastern Time Zone. Eastern time zones doing well. We're we're keeping it we're keeping it going. Um, Central time's a lot easier, uh, <laughs> but over here in the east, we're uh, we're trying to hold it down, keep up with the Central time, Mountain time. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> no, that that's that's a world I don't even want to think about. You know, yeah, don't don't even Tiger. want to deal with that. But all right, Mississippi State athletics right now, we're in a good spot. I mean, we got basketball teams winning, we got baseball teams winning. We had a, uh, you know, we're even going to talk about the uh, way out of season. It just means more sport in football because we haven't really talked about uh, signing day at all. And I feel like that is an important thing to discuss. So, you know, we're just going to cover the whole gauntlet of things right now. We're going to run the gauntlet. We're going to cover everything. But looking at uh, basically the month of February in basketball, pretty good all in all. I mean, you had two rough losses happens to be the two of uh, the best teams in the conference. Uh, One team in Kentucky that for some reason people have decided should be a number one seed, even though I, I I think that could be a 16 and one upset if (laughs) if they end up as a one seed. Yeah. Well, they won't get the, uh, the rep arena officiating help. Right. Exactly. Um, You have the overtime loss to LSU who, uh, I mean, this season of LSU basketball will, likely be vacated at some point in the near future if things go the way that they're looking. But um, interesting game. But after you get through those two, I mean, even before that, of course, was getting revenge at Ole Miss in a hard-fought game. But then you had a uh, almost 20-point victory against Alabama. You had a 10-point victory at Arkansas. You had a close victory at Georgia that you actually attended um, in maybe the strangest game that we've seen in a long time. <laughs> that was a strange couple of days for me. Uh, the Georgia game and then the day after I might get into a little bit of that. Uh, yeah. Maybe yeah. I think minute. we should. Um, because I, I'm, I need you to explain to the listeners what it is that I'm looking at on my computer <laughs> screen. Um, but then of course, 15 point win over South Carolina, almost 20 point win over Missouri. Uh, I mean, five in a row finishing February with a very nice six and two record. Um, I mean, essentially, for all intents and purposes, punching the ticket into March uh, madness, you would think. I think most people are looking at the team's resume and saying this is a tournament team. Uh, that was the mission number one at the beginning of this season, and it seems like they've accomplished that, which is very exciting. Right now it's kind of playing for seating, um, playing for uh, a little bit more respect to the committee, but it does help in some of that as well that we've We've reached a point in which, like, we uh, have no bad losses on the resume. Um, the SEC as a whole has been very tough. But anyway, you're looking at the team right now, winners of five straight, um, looking to hopefully end the season strong. Um, what are you? What are your impression of, the, of these this team right here? What's been the the deciding point? That's what's what's been making them so successful right now. I think it took some time, uh, probably a little bit longer than uh, people like us would have liked for um, for the guys on the team to kind of settle into their role. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a part of that um, has been the progression of uh, Reggie Perry um, coming yeah. in his own. And, um, and with Nick Weatherspoon being out for, um, I think, four games now, um, you know, that kind of coming out of nowhere. And, of course, everybody's thinking that it's going to be um, you know, catastrophic for the team. Um, if not, 
just for um, Nick's talent level and what he brings to the team, but just depth wise. Um, Cause now I think we're really only going seven deep, but um, it brought out a Tyson Carter that I don't think any of us have really seen before. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, he's doing things that um, are, are really impressive. And, um, and Lamar um, kind of being more of the, um, facilitator of the offense and not, Hey, I need to go out and get 20, um, you know, get my shots up type of guy, you know, if, when he's open and sometimes when he's not so open, he still takes those shots, but Hey, the other night he, he went over five dished out five assists, assists and got four steals and, uh, still a great game for Lamar. And, uh, mm-hmm. Q is playing lights out. Um, I think he shot my right eye out when I saw him at, uh, in Athens. <laughs> but um, he, he, since SEC play has started, Q is, Q's playing like he's SEC player of the year. Um, you talk about an MVP, I don't know where this team would be without, without Q. So, yep. um, well, that's, guys, that's a great point. And that's a thought that I was having earlier is that I wonder if there's anyone else in the conference that you could say is more valuable to the team than – Quindary Weatherspoon has been in conference play. I mean, leading the SEC in points per game with almost 20 a game. Um, I mean, value-wise, yeah, I get that player of the year goes to uh, just whoever's on a good team. You know, it's kind of just how things work because the SEC doesn't really understand basketball. But uh, you can't – I don't know if you can make an argument that there's anyone that's more valuable to their team in an MVP you know, sort of way than Quindary Weatherspoon. Exactly. I mean, he he had a career high um, in Athens uh, with, I think, 31. 31. I might be wrong. Yeah. 31. And we needed all 31. <laughs> and <laughs> yep. I don't think there's another player on the team that, that could that could put up put up 31. So, um, yeah, he, he's been uh, the quintessential put the team on his back type of senior in uh, – haven't seen that in a, in a really long time, um, especially a guy on a team that has some um, postseason, you know, goals to look forward to. So, um, yeah, he's playing great, and uh, the rest of the team is is finding their their niche in uh, in the game plan. And um, yeah, all things are kind of rolling right now. We'll see what we can do on the road at Auburn. But um, yeah, February uh, it's it's been a good month. That for sure. it has. Yeah, hard to, um, very hard to look at February. Hard to see, you know, look back and see anything super negative. Yeah, I know LSU um, was a rough game. In fact, there actually was, that was the most frustrated and discouraged I've been about this team all season was that LSU game because there's no reason to have lost to LSU other than complete lack of effort. Um, That's essentially what it was. And uh, it was very frustrating to see that because when the team was playing hard in that game, lack of consistent effort, I'll say that. When the team was playing hard against LSU, they were controlling the game like we've seen them do many times. A lot of defensive stops, causing a lot of turnovers, getting a lot of steals, um, and you know, scoring in the fast break. That's what this team is incredibly good at. When they did that against LSU, when they focused on doing that against LSU, it worked out well. When they got lax on that, LSU worked them, especially on the rebounding uh, side of things. So very frustrating right there. And that was the most frustrated I'd been with this team all season long. So to respond the way that they did, um, go off. I know the Kentucky games, whatever. I don't even really want to talk much about the Kentucky game. But uh, you look at the five-game winning streak, you see a little bit more resiliency. You see really the emergence of, as you said, you know, like Reggie Perry, as being an absolute force. Um, And then by the end of all that stretch, you started to see a little bit of a return, in particular the final 10 minutes of the Missouri game. You see a return to being um, the team that we saw in non-conference play. Um, Some of those factors being, like you mentioned, Tyson Carter, um, but one of those factors being like a return of Eric Holman being a very productive player. Let's talk a little bit about Eric Holman right now. He had been frustrating for most of conference play, but in uh, in the past few um, games here, uh, in, in particular, uh, well, the past two in particular, Missouri and South Carolina, I think you really started to see look, just a little bit more effort out of Eric Holman, and maybe not always reflected in the uh, 
the the box score itself because I mean he only had nine points uh, and a, a few rebounds against um, Missouri in particular, but you saw effort out of him. Um, how important is he to the team uh, when he is motivated? Well, back to the beginning of the conference play, that was just the one of the things that was just so strange to see coming from a non-conference slate where he was playing so well um, and had effort. He was shooting the ball well. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just, for some reason, um, didn't seem like his head was totally in the game. I mean, there, there could have been something going on. But yeah. when – when he is at his best, he's he 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 could really be a difference maker. Um, being a guy that can step out, make the outside shot, and be a guy who can protect the rim, um, you know, guy that can get those rebounds and and defend the post. We we don't have um, we don't have a ton of guys. Well, well, let me rephrase: we didn't have a lot of guys. Um, with the experience um, on the post that he had, um, it was really just um, Eric and uh, Abdullah. Do yeah. you really could uh, you really could have said we don't have a ton of guys and ended the sentence there, and it would have <laughs> absolutely applied. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. Um, and I think having um, Reggie come along as he as he has, and Eric being able to come off the bench, um, you know. That, that's that's when he was at his best in in seasons prior, as well as uh, being that first guy off the bench. Um, um, you know, mental things with players. Um, that's why there are things that yeah. That's why there are sports psychologists. <laughs> yeah, they 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 can explain these type of things and help people get out of, of things like that. And um, being the guy that that comes off the bench, it just does it for him. I, I I don't know why um, he he just plays better that way and um, yeah when he when he's fully in um, he's a good player now when yep. he's not you can see the the LSU game the final yeah. oh gosh you know twelve minutes or so I mean just stuff where guys would would start driving to the rim from outside the three point line yeah and he's he's in the paint and just goes right on by that the stuff like that just makes you scratch your head. Yep. Um, but yeah, th this last game um, played much better, and um, um, the team the team is much better for it. So yeah, yeah, the experience factor is so important with a guy like that. But I do wonder if coming off the bench, I mean, it could have done a couple of things. It could have either been a wake up call to him that hey, just because you're a senior here doesn't mean we're not gonna um, give the freshman who has been absolutely killing it. Uh, you know, more playing time, give him the start. Or if it's a uh, a situation of um, him accepting, hey, you know what? Like, I can benefit the team a lot better right here. Um, I can, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the mentality is in terms of that. It Maybe he just, there was too much pressure and he just needed a break from having to be the starter in order to get his head straight. You know, but there was definitely something that was off for a lot of um, conference play in terms of his, uh, I don't know, his motivation seemed just non-existent. So it's very good to see him putting in more effort, putting in more valuable time. Um, and uh, yeah, just real, real uh, enjoyable time for sure. Um, I also think I was accidentally reading off maybe Robert Woodard's stats when I talked about Eric scoring and all that in uh, the Missouri game, and that's on me. Um, so my bad. But uh, Hey, that's okay. The, really, the only stat you, you need to know um, concerning Robert Woodard, points, yeah, those are, mm -hmm. those are whatever. You know what I mean? The one thing you really need to know about that guy is that every game he's due for some dirty, southern, nasty, in your face block out of nowhere. Yep. That is uh <laughs> incredibly impressive and <laughs> I look and forward to it every time because it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen and it's deeply satisfying every time. Yeah, deeply yeah. satisfying. Um I'm gonna jump over real quick to the Tyson Carter subject here. Um because it's it's huge, especially with um this 
unknown suspension to uh, Nick Weatherspoon, Tyson had been such an incredible sixth man um, all over the course of the entire season, but then ramping it up when he needs to. He's got this rare, one of the rare gifts. I call it the Shane Battier gift <laughs> of knowing when you need to do something and knowing when you don't need to so you don't put that much pressure on yourself. Like Shane Battier might have been the best uh, – in the NBA I'd ever seen at, okay, if I need to score 30 points, I'm going to score 30 points. If I don't need to score 30 points, then I'm going to just do a bunch of other stuff to make my teammates score points. You know what I mean? That um, is a fantastic comparison. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I mean, it's just, it, I just remember watching Shane Battier play uh, in, in the NBA and just going, man, that dude will just do whatever it takes to win and does not care about the credit at all. And that's what you see out of Tyson Carter. Yeah, he can score 22 points against Missouri if that's what it takes um, for, you know, somebody to, to or for the team to pull off a victory. Um, but he can also put in 39 minutes as the primary point guard, only get 11 points, but four assists with no turnovers – against uh you know georgia right um mm -hmm. you know as like the you know primary distributor there you know you could do stuff like that that is uh really really cool and it reminds me of a story i remember hearing um during his high school days of one of the reasons why he was not looked at by a lot of other places is that his his father of course his high school basketball coach uh, ran a very patient ball control sort of offense um, and Tyson was uh, never asked to be like an elite scorer or anything like that in that offense because that's not the type of game that they played. So a lot of people saw it and they're like, oh, yeah, well, he's quite gifted, you know, good shooter, blah, blah, blah. Then to have um, a he, AAU game where the team is playing a completely different, more up, you know, up tempo, classic AAU shootout style of play. And Tyson starts scoring, you know, 25 points a game um, just because he can and has to, you know. And so it, I think at that point is when people started to realize, oh, my gosh, like this kid uh, actually does have all, a much more well-rounded game than we thought. <laughs> we just never see it because his dad doesn't coach like that. <laughs> well, so, that's that's how Greg Carter played yeah. as well. That he was he was a guy like that, too. So yep. I could see him coaching that way as well. Oh, yeah, no doubt. So that's what I think we see out of Tyson Carter is just the the calmness to just kind of know what to do in any situation, um, whether it is uh, completely um, take over a game like in Missouri, like be the guy who's scoring points, you know, or whether it's like just control the ball, uh, do what you need to do. Um, this The Georgia game in particular, I remember he did not shoot very well, um, which is a shame. Uh, because it kind of overshadows what he did do very well. But then you go to uh, the South Carolina game. And I mean, three of six from three point range. Once again, no turnovers on the game, three steals. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a heck of a, that's a heck of a stat line in what was a, a hard fought game and a good game. So Tyson Carter, his ability to do what needs to be done is, uh, can't be, it can't be expressed enough how good that is. Um, along with that, though, I do notice that in a lot of these games, even now, we're we're going back to being able to find different ways to win because we uh, are not shooting from long range incredibly well. I just looked South Carolina. What was that from three point range? Oh, no, that was a good one. That was uh, we ended up 44 percent from deep. OK, that's a good one. Never mind. Yeah, I think we Maybe turned I it on in the, in the second half um, pretty good because we started out man, we the beginning of that South Carolina game was about as bad of a start as a basketball team can possibly have. Yeah. Um, only, <laughs> down, only, I think. only overshadowed by the beginning of the Georgia game that happened just a little few days earlier. <laughs> well, well, okay. So for the Georgia game, both teams um, started out a basketball game. I think as bad as, as it could start out. That was just, that was putrid. That was, mm -hmm. that was some bad basketball. But uh, yeah, it's um, the yeah. we don't we don't have to win by shooting like like we did um, in the non-conference play. Not that we had to um, shoot ourselves for a win necessarily, but that's 
mm-hmm. that was one of the things that, that you could take away was, wow, we are a much improved perimeter shooting team. Yeah, and, like we and, were trying to make it a point almost that we yeah, could. I, <laughs> yeah. And we did. And we yeah. did. And, and uh, uh, coming, coming out of that, um, if you don't shoot the ball well, it's like, well, what do we go to now? And I think you're seeing – a guy like Q, he can really, I, I mean, he gets to the rim it, like, you know, like it's natural. I yep. mean, like that, that's what he was born to do. Oh, yeah. And then he'll, and then he'll just take those step back threes and he, he's just, he, he turned out to be a, a great player. And he came to Mississippi State when there really wasn't any reason to. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, I think, Mississippi State fans owe a lot to him and for Eric, honestly, um, coming in together. Um, and, uh, yeah, they, they've been great ambassadors for the university and, uh, have had really good careers. I know I kind of steer that conversation to, uh, thank you seniors, but, uh, <laughs> but it's a good point. Like as frustrated as I may have gotten at Eric Holman during a lot of conference play, um, you can't express enough his importance to getting the team to where they are right now. You know, you can't express enough about the fact that Q and Eric were instrumental in building a program back from a a rough shape. Uh, So, you know, yeah, thank you, seniors. Absolutely. I wouldn't be where we are right now without them. How about this? How about this whole season, though? Okay, like I I kind of alluded to earlier, I feel like um, the uh, the main goal is, okay. this is our year to get back in the tournament. That's what we're going to do. Uh, most everything I'm hearing has the Bulldogs in the national tournament. Um, you know, it, it, even if we didn't end well against, you know, Auburn, Tennessee and A&M, um, there's kind of like the ticket is punched. Bulldogs are in there sort of thing. What's your assessment of the season so far? I mean, it, obviously it's been a pretty successful year, but uh, you feeling like this is like we we achieved the goals like – just assuming that we're even in the tournament, or do you think that a battle for seeding is still necessary to really look at this uh, this season as being a very big success? You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I definitely get where it, where you're coming from there. Of course, the seeding um, any any time you can improve your seeding, obviously that's fantastic. But um, I think, like we've said in, in past episodes, the goal for the season was to get back to the tournament. Um, I believe it's been 10 years. I think, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. it's been a decade. Um, it has been a decade and the goal was to get back to the tournament. Now where I think fans got caught up a little bit was <clears throat> in determining if this was a success or a failure was where the losses came um, and kind of the sequence <laughs> in which they came is you go through non-conference play with one loss. You come into conference play and you don't start out so hot. And so I think that's going to set a precedent for the rest of um, the conference season. Um, if the, the wins and losses had been, <laughs> had been scattered around a little bit more, yeah, I think, I think, I think that we would have been a little bit more um, level-headed. Um, but also the ways in which we lost um, put a lot of fans in a state of, you know, we got all these guys on the team, and mm-hmm. and why are we losing games like this? And yep. um, like like LSU, they're doing that to everybody. Yeah, <laughs> they're beating oh, people yeah. in overtime for no reason at all. Because I, I think I think Mississippi State is just as good as as LSU is. Um, we we should have won that game. Um, Played ourselves out of it. That's the like yeah. the main thing about that is that we played ourselves out of it, and that's what made it so frustrating. It, it's hard to even fathom LSU being, if the season ended right now, they would be the one seed in the SEC tournament. I believe. Um, I think that's right. Um, be, well, with beating Kentucky, um, which is right. Can we talk a bit about LSU beating Kentucky and the way that they're able to beat Kentucky? Did you see the end of that game? I did see the end of it. And, um, well, I think LSU is the only team that can uh, beat Kentucky like that this season, at least. I don't know. It's maybe the dumbest thing. 
<laughs> talking about LSU in, in Kentucky kind of makes my blood boil yeah. a little bit. <laughs> it was maybe the, it was maybe the dumbest thing I've seen. Well, until apparently some of the stuff that went down between uh, Tennessee and Ole Miss uh, mm. on the night now that we are recording that uh, I didn't see it happen live. I've just seen some of the reactions on Twitter and all, and that seemed to be possibly one of the dumbest things to have ever been uh, to seen. I mean, it was like. I feel I will never after the DeMarcus Cousins game from a few years ago. <laughs> I will never ever condemn a fan base for getting mad at officials and throwing something on a basketball court because because <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that happened. And uh, ouch, that is not a good look on the SEC as a whole to have a game to have a couple of games um, later in the SEC slate handled like that it makes the conspiracy theorist in me once again speak up and like oh what's that is the sec trying to protect their higher seeds um is the sec trying to protect uh like lsu's chances of having a successful season because they're uh currently under fbi investigation what's that you know and they'll they'll release a statement (laughs) or something about it right kind of move on yep i did see uh just now someone on twitter and i just kind of had to um had to uh, quote it real quick if I can find where the person is so I can give them credit. Um, but the tweet basically said, man, this uh, this Tennessee Ole Miss rivalry is getting toxic. <laughs> we, no, the SEC cannot have another toxic rivalry. No. no. One toxic rivalry is, is more than any conference can handle. So. Right. <laughs> Oh, getting toxic. If I can find that tweet again. Oh, there it is. It was Paul Jones from 24-7 Sports. So there you go. Paul Jones, who said it. Um, he's a uh, he's the guy that handles the Bulldogs 24-7, uh, 24-7 sports page. So Paul tweeting fire. Hot fire. Paul tweeting hot fire. Hot fire. Yeah, anyway, good basketball season. Been a frustrating basketball season at times because it looked as though we were about to waste a talented group of players, um, much like, I don't know, football season. So I think that's what, <laughs> <laughs> that's what made fans such as myself uh, stressed out at times um, was this worry that it was about to be a, uh, you know, a, a, a repeat of what we just went through in the fall. But it has not really turned out that way. And uh, That is still a good a, point. <laughs> yeah. And it just was stressful. It was stressful. We all got worried. And it looks like things are on the good uh, end of the uh, um, potential spectrum in terms of how the season will end up. You look at those last three games real quick with Auburn, Tennessee, and a and two of those on the road, Auburn and Tennessee. you going to try to make it to that Auburn game? Are you working Saturday? <sighs> no, nah, I'm working. Working on Saturday. Um, mm-hmm. I think uh, game tips off as I get off of work, so I'll probably be able to see most of it. But All right, that's good. Yeah. Would you look at those three games? What do you think? Uh, what do you think the record will be in those three games? Ooh, I gotta tell you, I, I think it's going to be three and one. Um, reason being, hold on, hold on. There's three games. Did you say two and one or three and oh, oh? two? Two and one. Yeah, we. Yeah, the Missouri. Sorry. Yep. Um, I think it's going to be two and one. The reason being, um, the 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 key to the rest of the season, in my opinion, is uh, this Saturday on the road at Auburn. Um, okay. Road wins are hard to come by, yeah. uh, no matter who you play. Um, Auburn has been very Jekyll and Hyde. They, they're they trending down a little bit. Um, they're, they're kind of fighting for their, for their life a little bit yeah. right now. Um, very perimeter-oriented team. Um, I think – with the style of play that we can that we can play um, with with a guy like Reggie Perry coming on as he's coming on and the way Tyson Carter has been playing um, a guy who, who's not turning the ball over and is not as bad of a defender mm-hmm. well I wouldn't say bad but but he's he's not as far off from a guy like Nick Weatherspoon I, I right. think that, that people think. Probably, um, probably not going to be as much of a lockdown guy, but he's very uh, Steph Curry opportunistic in terms of yeah. like getting steals, causing turnovers like that, which is huge. Which is huge, right? I, I think I think that game is is going to kind of um, determine. Hey, we might have a chance uh, against Tennessee 
um, on the road. Um, Tennessee is kind of they're they're uh, they're showing a little they're uh, chink, a chink in the armor. Yeah. Um, um, but I don't know on the road it, that, that that's going to be tough, um, especially if guys get into foul trouble because our our depth right now is, is a little bit of an issue. Um, <laughs> guys get into foul trouble. So um, yeah, I think I think we'll win we'll win a close one this weekend in Auburn and um, Texas A and M being the last game of the year, that might've thrown in the towel already. Um, I think Arkansas is kind of throwing in the towel too. So yeah. Um, yeah, I think two and one. Um, but if it's one and two, that's not the end of the world. Um, no. we're, we're, we're pretty solid in the uh, six, seven, eight seed range. You know, right. if we, if we pull off um, a good two and one record, possibly get a double buy in the SEC tournament, um, maybe get a win or two there. You could push for a five seed. Um, we'll just have to see. It it helps that right now. I mean, between Auburn and A and M, those are two of the lower end teams in the conference right now in terms of record goes. I know Auburn is seven and seven, and just you know a little bit behind uh, both Bama and Florida. Um, but I mean, A and M only five uh, conference wins. Um, looking at it right here. I mean, yeah, it's not, it's not ideal <laughs> uh, for, for those two teams. So yeah, Tennessee is showing some weaknesses. Um, it kind of depends, I think largely on whether the SEC wants to protect the, one of their top seeds in Tennessee. Um, that's a joke. I'm just kidding everyone. I'm not that big of a conspiracy theorist yet, yet, but uh, yeah, I mean, I could, I'm with you. I could very easily see a two and one through this stretch there's not a whole lot about AM that seems too intimidating this year. It's almost as if uh, something happened to them in the past couple of seasons and they have not been able to recruit quite as well as they used to. I can't imagine what that would have been um, that would have happened to them. Maybe if they had some sort of assistant coach who was a good recruiter <laughs> and left them. I don't know. Um, but AM not not a hot team right now, and Auburn is falling apart. And Tennessee is – like Mississippi state lost games at the right time of the season to lose games. You know, you yeah. want to, you want to lose some games in January and early February so you can correct issues and go on a, I don't know, five game win streak at the end of February leading into March. <laughs> um, I know it's, it's very cliche to say, um, especially for all the bracketology guys out there saying uh, teams that, that get hot at the wrong time. I, I don't really yeah. understand that kind of frame of mind because you look at a season as a whole, but state is one of those teams. They're, they're figuring things out um, when it matters the most. So um, yeah. Yeah. When it, for the bracket. Yeah. For the bracketology stuff, I don't understand that at all for the like predicting who's going to win once the seating is coming out. Absolutely. That's key. <laughs> you yes. want to look at the way a team ended the season to figure out how it is that they're going to respond when they get into the postseason. Right now, Mississippi State is winning again at the right time in terms of carrying momentum in. Uh, Auburn had struggled throughout conference play at finding any level of consistency. And Tennessee starting to lose at the wrong time to lose. Um, and I, who knows if State can go to Knoxville and actually make it happen or not. But at the very least, you'd think 2-1 and one should be achievable. And 3-0 uh, and o through it all might be. Might be, which would be very, very interesting. So promising stuff right now. I think that, you know, obviously the keys are whether Perry continues playing like he is, whether Tyson continues playing like he is, and uh, whether the, the MVP in Q Weatherspoon continues dropping 20 points a night. Pretty crazy stuff. Uh, let's switch over to baseball real quick. I mean, we got the brand new dude has opened up. It's looking incredible. I have not been to it this season. Uh, my New Year's resolution actually was to try to make it to more baseball games this year. Uh, only made it to one last season. Got to see the half-completed Duty Noble Field. And even half-completed, it was an impressive place. So I can only imagine what it'll be like to see it in person this year. I'm going to try my best to get there at some point soon. Uh, but opening opening the season well so far through a few uh, series and matchups, Um only one loss, and that happens to be a one-run extra innings loss to a quite good Southern Miss program. Um, and as a side note, 
I love the fact that the three main Mississippi schools in state Ole Miss and Southern Miss will play each other in baseball. Like, I wish it happened more often in the other main sports, but I love the fact that they keep it going in baseball. Um, and you can count on that happening because it also happens to be the sport in which all three of them are like most consistently competitive or at least most consistently on the same level as each other. So it makes for some entertaining baseball. But uh, besides that one loss, I mean, you've got uh, big time victories to open the season against Youngston State, uh, 3-2 win over UAB sprinkled in there, um, 8-1, 4-3 against Southern Miss, two victories there, Jackson State 17 to 4, and keeping up on Twitter right now, it looks as though um the uh it is 12 to nothing right now, Mississippi State over Southeastern Louisiana. Um so that game you would assume should end in a victory as well. Guess we'll have to wait to find out, but looking at this team right now, this this baseball team for the Bulldogs, um uh, and in my, Looking in particular at the way that they were able to win that third game against Southern Miss, it seems like they're just kind of picking up right where they left off in terms of how they're playing, what type of team they are. What have you seen in this? I mean, it's hard to tell at the beginning of a season what to make of anything in, uh, in, in this particular sport, but what's been your impression of this team so far? My impression of the team. Yeah, and I do um, also, of course – air to you a lot or default to you a lot more in this because I feel like you have a much baseball is not my sport. I feel like you have a much better understanding of the sport of baseball than I could ever have. So I love baseball. Baseball is, Hey, I'm going to be the ROTC baseball nerd. Please. Um, uh, I I was just talking to my wife about this when uh, I first got home and was uh, checking Twitter and seeing what was going on with the baseball team tonight, um, yeah. Southeastern Louisiana, they, they don't have a bad program. Uh, they, they've, they've gotten us a couple midweek games they have, yeah. uh, before. Um, they are very, very talented in areas that we weren't sure about. Um, the, we, we knew what we had in a guy with Ethan small being a, mm-hmm. a Friday night starter. He's yep. being, he's been even better than we thought he would be. Yeah. I mean, it, it, um, he's had a couple of no decisions so far, which is unfortunate, but I mean, he had 13 strikeouts and no walks <laughs> in the game that we lost one to nothing, um, against Southern Miss. And I mean, that game, um, we hit the ball hard, just right at people, which that's yeah. baseball. You can't really do much about that, but a guy like Justin Foscue at, at third base, um, He's been a guy who's just been absolutely crushing the baseball. Unbelievable. Um, I, I, I watched a video of a grand slam that he hit tonight. Yeah. Um, I mean, he is just killing the ball. And a, a senior catcher, Dustin Skelton, who, um, who's been uh, solid behind the plate uh, in his career, um, mostly backing up some guys. But he hit a ball to straight away center field out of the park <laughs> in a game in which he hit two home runs <laughs> that I, I wish people could really understand how difficult that is. <laughs> oh yeah. Dead, dead center field. We're, we're hitting the ball with power um, and, and guys that are having slow starts uh, like Rowdy Jordan. Um, we've seen what he's capable of as a freshman. Um, yep. So baseball is one of the things that, that we're, Things tend to either trend up or down. <laughs> yeah, and, and he, we know, we know he's going to trend upwards. So a lot of the guys that that we weren't sure about in positions are uh, um, playing very, very well. And, and you know, first round draft pick um, JT Ginn being our, our Saturday guy so far, he's been incredible. Um, he's got some nasty stuff, and he's playing not like he's a freshman. Yeah. Um, uh, kind of along with that, I mean, we know names like Jake Mangum, obviously. Everyone loves Jake Mangum, talks about Jake Mangum all the time. Um, you know, uh, Foscu has, has established a name for himself. You know, um, you were just talking about uh, Rowdy, for example, uh, really came alive by the end of the end of the season in particular. I mean, um, but then you have some guys like you were just talking about, a lot of improvement in pitching. Um, I've noticed, such as like tonight, uh, Peyton Plumley had 
eight strikeouts through five innings before a rain delay against wow. Southeast Louisiana. Um, so he's starting off front. Do you think that? Uh, I mean, obviously it's difficult to tell again early season, but is this uh, just a much a better uh, group of pitchers than we had last year? Um. <clears throat> Well, I, I can say this for a fact: we we have a much healthier pitching staff um, that we, <laughs> that we yeah. had for much of last season, so that always helps. Um, I think um, our starting guys um, have been much more dominant so far. I mean, granted, once you get into SEC play, everybody's talent level is yeah <laughs> bumped up a notch. I mean, poor <laughs> Connor Pilkington last year. Um, uh, ended up with a losing record with, for, for a, a guy who was a, a first, I think a first round draft pick by the White Sox. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'll fact check that. I'll fact check that for you. Um, yeah, just bad luck. But um, yeah, pitching has been phenomenal. We only had one one poor bullpen outing so far. But um, yeah, for a guy like Peyton Plumley who who missed an entire season to come into a a game like that and have eight strikeouts through five innings. That's great. We're not walking guys. Um, people are, are um, our pitchers are showing a lot of control and consistency and, um, and showing just nasty stuff. Um, Cause if you can locate the, if you can locate the ball on both sides of the plate and um, you've got a, a, a nasty ball that you can throw in the dirt, um, you're going to, you're going to get a lot of people out. And, uh, and they've, they've shown that they can do that, plus with an offense that's uh, hitting the ball out of the yard, um, mm. even with guys like Jake Mangum is having a slow start to Jake <laughs> Mangum's standards. But um, It's been a real w- rough, what, two weeks for him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If even that. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that's – my impression so far has been that this is a well-rounded team. Um, last year, it seemed like you had to rely quite a bit on uh, the ability to hit the ball and especially the ability to smack out some home runs <laughs> uh, by the end of the year. I mean, it was a proverbial highlight film uh, with a lot of games, um, uh, especially when you got into the postseason uh, with j- dramatic, uh, not just home runs, but dramatic, just like walk off winners, all that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, this seems like a little bit more well-rounded squad to start the season off. Obviously, you can't tell too much, I don't think, um, this early in the year, but it's promising. It's definitely promising. Uh, The next step, or the next stop, I mean, um, comes this weekend in the Frisco Classic against Sam Houston State, Texas Tech, and then Nebraska um, out in Frisco, Texas at Dr. Pepper Ballpark, which is the coolest thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, do you think that uh, we will continue this hot start to the season uh, in terms of what we've been able to see? I mean, both pitching and hitting, like, wh- what do you think uh, if you had, a, I mean, obviously I don't know how much we even know about Sam Houston state, Texas tech and Nebraska, as far as baseball goes, but um, I mean, this squad, do you think they have it, what it takes to continue playing hot? Like they've started off so far. Yeah, I think the the key to the Frisco Classic is going to be um, is going to lie in JT Ginn um, going up against Texas Tech. Uh, traditionally, they um, much like Big Twelve offenses in football, <laughs> they are known for the big play. They they Texas Tech they're they're known to hit the baseball and hit the baseball out of the yard. So um, having a a freshman come in in his third start. Yeah. Um, against a, a top top five consensus top ten uh, team in Texas Tech is going to show, um, I think, what this team is capable of. Um, I know that one game is really just uh, a snapshot of a team. Um, you only have as much momentum as is next day's starter, but um, you know, same Houston State's got a good squad. I think Ethan Small is going to have a um, another Ethan Small outing against Sam Houston State. Um, now if you can pair that with, with some runs that always helps. So, um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I think for a lot of teams, um, and this, this is the same with basketball too. Um, these kind of non-conference, um, neutral site 
uh, tournaments are really good for a team. Um, they're a good measuring stick early in the year, um, especially for a coaching staff to, to see what a team is capable of before conference play even starts. Because mm-hmm. generally you have, um, you have one or two solid teams, um, really, really solid teams in there. Um, and to, to match yourself up with those um, early in the season before you really have found an identity yet is really important. So um, that'll be something to watch. I know the guys at D1 Baseball, um, they, they'll be out there. <laughs> I love D1 Baseball. Um, <laughs> we, all, we consistently ask um, every single year um, our, our regional hosting chances with those guys. <laughs> uh, I think after after every pitch, we will <laughs> we'll yeah, ask yeah. Aaron Fitt. Got to. If, it's tradition at this point. Yeah, it's tradition. Um <laughs> So yeah, looking forward looking forward to the uh, Frisco Classic because that'll be a, a good measuring stick for the team. Definitely, definitely, it's going to be entertaining. I'm looking forward to it too. Um, quick fact check, by the way, Connor Pilkington was selected in the third round of the MLB draft last year. Um, signed for uh, six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So oh, okay, so like that's a decent. so that's like a ten year AAF career, <laughs> right? <laughs> Love the AAF. Uh, how about the Birmingham Iron, man? Man, they're solid. We're Doing talking about solid. iron. More like the Birmingham Iron Curtain. That's the Hey, that's their defense's nickname. It's so good. Oh, really? Yeah, they call their defense the Iron Curtain, which is fitting and awesome. Fantastic. So. Well, I'm looking forward to the uh, Atlanta Legends heading over there March 31st yep. and getting their butts kicked because they are terrible. Yeah, they're not they're not doing well, and I am serious about trying to get over there. Oh, me too. Uh, I'm looking at it actually. Mississippi State baseball plays LSU in Starkville the weekend of the 28th, 29th, and 30th. So, then hmm. I can go to go to that, hit the road to Birmingham for the 31st, then head on home. Just saying, big plans, big plans. Oh, man, oh, man, I gotta I gotta get my calendar. Yeah, man. We need, <laughs> we need to coordinate all this. <laughs> coordinate all this. Um, hey, while we're talking about football and talking about the Birmingham Iron, who have four different former Mississippi State football players on their team, including Big Nick James, who showed up on the Birmingham Iron Instagram page, and it was hilarious because that man is massive. Um, let's talk a little bit about the old pig skin because the NFL Combine is going on this week. It's actually already started, but the fun stuff doesn't happen until the weekend whenever players actually take the field. We got all these like psych examinations and stuff for the first few days. That sounds boring. So the combine going on, we got some dogs participating in the combine. And it reminded me that we have not really had a chance to chat much about this recruiting class that Moorhead was able to pull in this year. Of course, uh, most – I don't care – much for recruiting rankings. I think that recruiting stars, recruiting rankings are all hogwash. Um, but it is reassuring to see most websites that, you know, try to pass this stuff off as legitimate claim that this was a, you know, top 25 recruiting class. Um, <clears throat> though, oddly enough, still, I'm looking at 24 seven composite in particular, and it's like 24th in the nation, but 11th in the conference. <laughs> it just means more. It just means more. But this class, I mean, what's your impression of this class? Obviously, you got a few high-profile players such as Charles Cross from Laurel and Garrett Schrader, the quarterback, um, along with Nathan Pickering, uh, the uh, the defensive tackle, who looks like maybe the next in the long line of uh, – he and, and – uh, yeah, him being the next in the long line of strong Mississippi State defensive interior defensive linemen. But what's your initial impression of this class when you look at them? Well, you know, it's <clears throat> I, I think for for this for this class, I, once it got late in the process um, after the uh, early signing period, yeah. um, you know, missing out on on some guys like. Uh, like Ming, uh, Mingo, uh, yeah. wide receiver from Brandon. Yeah. You know, th- those, those kind of things. They that hurt. Huge. Um, but you were able to get 
a bookend tackle. Yep. You were able to get the quarterback of the future, and you were able to get guys like uh, you know Nathan Pickering, like I already said, um, King Ani Azuchikwu. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think out of uh, Nashville, I believe. Yes, um, Davidson Academy. Yeah. So, and, and let's not also, forget uh, Demonte Russell from Demonte Provo. Russell. There yeah. you go. Another defensive um, end. So, yeah, you're able to shore up the offensive and defensive line for the future, get your quarterback of the future. Um, you know, linebacker was a weak spot. Um, wide receiver was a weak spot. But I think uh, um, getting a guy like uh, Javante Payton, I believe, is his name. Um, That's him from Northwest Community yeah. College. Yeah, yeah from Northwest. Um, you know, needing, needing a guy with experience on the outside. Um, yeah. That's been something where – you know, lacking a little bit, but um, tremendously. yeah, that, that, that can help out a lot. So I think shoring up the, the line of scrimmage and getting the quarterback of the future was, um, it, it seemed like the goal, um, yeah. for, for Moorhead and then anything else like, like a Mingo or, um, uh, name, names for the name is slipping my mind, but, um, outside linebacker, defensive end signed with, Signed with Auburn. Um, so my mind. I, I don't know. I remember the the kid that went to Georgia, the big time linebacker. Oh yeah, N- yeah, Nicobe Dean. That that yeah. would have been something yeah. out of nowhere. That's that yeah. kind of stuff would have been icing on the cake. Um, yeah, but I think we did a good enough job and and checked off a lot of boxes that needed to be checked off. Um, is Char- Charles Cross? He is the highest rated. You know. Take that with a grain of salt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, offensive lineman that we've ever signed. Yeah. So, um, so almost an assuredly going to be a bust, <laughs> <laughs> or not even on the team. Yeah, exactly. Transfer so. to Alabama A and M within a year or two, something like that. Is that where? Uh, no, I'm trying to. I was trying to emulate the uh, uh, Ryan Paralu, wherever Ryan Paralu from LSU ended up. Uh, Jacksonville State. Jacksonville State. Thank you. I got the wrong small Alabama school in my head, and for that I apologize for offending both Alabama A and M and Jacksonville State. Ah, well, that's all right. Ryan Pirlo, That that is a that is a name that I have not thought about in a long time. But he had yeah. he had quite a story. Yeah, I think about him more often than I probably should. To be honest with you. Yeah, I think it's a. I think this is a very very uh, useful class. For primarily what you were saying, you know, football for as complicated as the modern offense is, especially a Moorhead offense, and we saw we saw the issues with how complicated a Moorhead offense is last season. Um, as as complicated as football can be, I mean, at the end of the day, if you win the line of scrimmage, you win the game more than anything else. Alabama understands that. You know, that's why Alabama has so many uh, offensive linemen and defensive linemen that are you know, huge prospects, huge recruits coming out of high school. Like they understand, yeah, sure. You might be able to snag a, uh, a uh, Calvin Ridley, um, a uh, Julio Jones over the years, you know, something like that, but at uh, a Tua Tagovailoa, you know, Um, but if you don't have the, you win because of the offensive and defensive line, you win by controlling the line of scrimmage. Um, this is a class that is very clearly trying to focus on controlling the line of scrimmage for, first and foremost. I mean, you bring in experienced offensive linemen like uh, LaQuinston Sharp from East Mississippi. Um, you got uh, – who else did we get? We got like seven offensive linemen, I believe, in this recruiting class. Brandon yeah. <laughs> Cunningham from Ocean Springs. Uh, Nick Pendley from Creekview High School in Canton, Georgia. Um uh, Brevin Jones from Birmingham. Yeah, I mean, obvious focus there on doing that. Uh, but there's a couple of positions in particular that I think uh, need to get maybe a little bit more uh, credit for the fact that Moorhead went after um, two, I don't know, could have been very easily overlooked needs. One of those being running back depth. Uh, with Aries Williams having graduated, um, with, uh, I know he didn't really play a huge, uh, amount, but, uh, oh no, I just drew a blank on his name. Ah, a kid from Oak Grove in Hattiesburg. Ah, well, it'll come to me when I least expect it. Um, anyway, 
uh, <laughs> wow, this is really embarrassing that I just drew a blank on his name. But anyway, when you just have, uh, I mean, two running backs on the roster in Kylan uh, Hill and uh, Nick Gibson, then it's huge to be able to grab like a Juco running back and Kareem Walker, who at the time he was coming out of high school was a uh, very highly recruited, very highly touted running back recruit. Um, it, even if he doesn't live up to, you know, best in the nation type of potential. I mean, it still is huge for depth purposes to be able to rotate. Um, but then along with it, I think the most intriguing uh, recruit that we got by far is Lee Witherspoon from Alabama, the guy that, you know, ran for, uh, what, nearly 3,000 yards, averaging uh, 20 yards a carry uh, in high in his senior year after having never played running back before. Um, in 4A high school, it's not like 1A or 2A. Like this was at least this was 4A high school in uh, Alabama, which I believe is a 6A state, but it might have 7A. Who knows? You know, um, I, I, I need to interject here. Yeah, <clears throat> a guy like Lee Witherspoon, that gives me hope. <laughs> you know, that gives me hope that I can go out there and never having done, oh, let's say start my own fortune 500 company. Yep. You know, that gives me hope that I could, <laughs> that I could just go out there and say, Hey, well, I'm gonna give that a shot. You know, start my own small business and then <laughs> end up being the CEO of a fortune 500 company. Right. So, and, and it's funny with, with him, he didn't get a lot of attention. No, because he was a defensive back, you know, why would he get that much of attention as a pretty good, but not great defensive back? <laughs> So then you're like, hey, let's put you on offense. Um, Speaking of which, by the way, uh, his name, Lee Witherspoon, reminded me that we were struggling to remember Dontavian Lee a second ago. There we go. (laughs) So apologies to Dontavian for your name escaping us. Um, uh, I think he was a – I know he never really saw a huge amount of playing time over his time in Starkville, but, you know, anyone that comes in and is a a four-year letter winner um, at a skilled position I think deserves some credit. Uh, for sure, and in, in what they bring to the program, maybe not on the ga- field during game days, but in practice and weight room in the locker room. I mean, that's that's a big time thing. So, um, yeah, but shoring up the running back position and Witherspoon, who just his story is incredible. If you're unfamiliar with Witherspoon, go look it up what he was able to do his senior year. But essentially, he rushed the ball about 12 times a game and would get uh, over 200 yards and like two touchdowns. No, like four touchdowns a game. It was stupid. Yeah, he had like 54 touchdowns. Yeah. <laughs> and they said, year. they said that they looked at it and uh, he had um, 17 more that were called back because of penalties. So he would have been uh, at like 71 rushing touchdowns on the year. It was stupid. Just stupid. Yeah, not good but, enough to play Bama. No, no, definitely not. Well, I mean, like he wasn't a running back. <laughs> he wasn't a running back. So who knows what he'll be like? He's a slender guy. I mean, all of 180 pounds, maybe. Um, But who cares? Let him redshirt for a year, learn the offense a little bit more, uh, learn more what Moorhead wants out of a player, get him out there, and uh, show that you know 99 overall speed (laughs) that he's clearly got uh, out there on the field. But one thing, all right, this is what I was going to say. The other thing that I think will get overlooked or get lost in all of this is the signing of. A uh, grad transfer, Corliss Waitman. Uh, Corliss Waitman is a punter coming in from South Alabama who was like first team all conference punter um, with very good uh, punting average um, as far as yardage goes. And also punted, <laughs> poor guy punted like 30 more times um, on the season that, uh, um, yeah, I'm looking at it. he punted like 30 more times on the season than uh, Tucker Day at Mississippi State did, um, but had a better net average, all that sort of stuff. So uh, I think it's very, very good to have brought in a little bit of more special teams help in that regard. So I think that's something that'll get overlooked, And but it's little things like that. It's fitting those needs of running back depth, maybe running back of the future if Witherspoon can show that he is a true – uh, running back talent and isn't just stupid fast. But even if he is just stupid fast, that's fine. <laughs> we have a good offensive yeah. line. Stupid fast goes a long way, man. Uh, 
So I think that's that's good stuff. Um, and then, of course, along with that, you do have, I mean, what, three different wide receivers in this class? Uh, Kaziah Pruitt from Knoxville County, Quentin Torber from uh, Destron, Louisiana, and uh, you already mentioned the the JUCO kid um, who I can't seem to find right now. Uh, Javante Payton from Northwest. So, I mean, wide receiver depth at a thin position. Um, yeah, I think this is a, all in all, I've, I've been quite impressed with this recruiting class. Like the more I look at it, I'm like, hey, you know what? This seems like it's fitting a lot of important needs. And I think that's huge. Maybe that's Absolutely. just. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I think that's probably all, about all I got. That's a lot of sports talk in there, folks. That's a lot of sports talk. That's a lot of sports talk. I apologize for all the sports talk. But, hey, we hadn't done this in a while, so I feel like we kind of need to. Uh, we hadn't done this whole weekly pessimist or monthly pessimist to think at this point. I don't think I, I don't think I've recorded one of these in the month, the month of February. So, well, it's never too late to be pessimistic about right. anything. We are Mississippi State fans. It is what we do. So uh, let's end this by throwing out a little bit of pessimism. Um, let's say, uh, okay, the basketball team uh, is winning five in a row. I think they will lose all three of the next ones and drop down to like an eight seed. That seems like the most pessimistic approach to the, the basketball team right now. Does that sound good? Hit me with a little bit of a little dose of pessimism. Well, I think we go 0 and three in the Frisco classic. Uh, we score a total of three runs. I think that Keaton Thompson is going to transfer. <laughs> I think that we decide to tear down the hump and build a completely new arena, which would just absolutely crush my soul. Gosh. Um, and I think that, uh, what's something else to be pessimistic about? <laughs> Let me think. Um, and I think, well, I think that, uh, that Charles cross ends up never breaking into the starting lineup on the football team. Oh, there we go. I, I you know what? I think Charles cross, <clears throat> I think he, will end up deciding to be an astrophysicist and take okay. football away from his life, which isn't really pessimistic. You no, know, it's not. More power that would actually him. be good for him. It'd be good for him, but he needs to understand this is the SEC where it just means more. Yeah. So he can't do that kind of crap. Get out of here with your astro science. Seriously. Disgusting. Disgusting. All right, I think that's some good pessimism. Bring us back down. We have to, have, we have to find the balance. We have to find the balance. But uh, I'd be devastated if Keaton left because, after all, he's the he was the real quarterback last year. Yeah. Why well, wasn't he playing? I know. He would have I thrown know. those touchdowns. Yeah, absolutely. Do you remember that game where he he completed all of uh, 37% of his passes? It was awesome. We need more of that. We need more of that. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Love Keaton. Looking forward to see what happens in football. But it is still basketball season and now baseball season. And I tell you what, it is beautiful to hear Jim Ellis's voice on the radio. You're it's telling so, me. It's you so it seems right. You know, before before we get off, yeah. On uh you know, just in this podcast. I cannot stand the sentiment that people have towards Jim Ellis. Well, not, not everybody, but there is a vocal crowd that does not like listening to Jim Ellis on the radio. Really? For once, really? for one simple reason, he doesn't say the score enough, oh. <laughs> which, which I understand to, to an extent, like that's an important thing to know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, he he's one of those guys who has baseball in his blood. He's been doing it for, man, I don't even know how long, but um, his voice is synonymous with Mississippi State baseball yep. and really SEC baseball. Um, <laughs> for people to say, I just wait till I get home to just turn the TV, to turn the TV on to listen to the <laughs> broadcasters on television. Oh, it's criminal. That is that is criminal. So I want to turn the pessimism of that around and say, you go, Jim Ellis. You keep telling us which direction the wind is blowing and what what color piping the teams have. Right. Oh, it's so beautiful. Like my mom will make mentions every now and then about how she thinks it's funny that he doesn't mention the score nearly enough. 
and we still often talk about these, you know, remembering him going off on tangents about like wanting to eat a hot dog and stuff like that from years ago. But I, yeah, he's a legend when it comes to baseball, uh, when it comes to baseball broadcasting. And I hope that he does it um, for the, you know, rest of time uh, for all eternity. I hope that even if like, you know, one day years from now he passes away, we have enough Jim Ellis sound clips where we can put together like a, an AI that sounds like Jim Ellis that can talk us through baseball games and just have, I hope the technology advances enough. So we always have him. That's, that's my ultimate hope. Well, I maybe think. Charles Cross can, uh, can make <laughs> that technology happen. Right. It's all on you, Charles. No pressure. <laughs> I love it. Great. Thank you for your time here on the, uh, whenever this happens, pessimist can't even say the pe- word pessimist correctly anymore. That's how, ugh. anyway, thank you for being here, man. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It, I, I'm so glad that, that I had this outlet to, uh, um, kind of voice things that have been, uh, you know, just inside this brain of mine for the past uh, month or so uh, regarding Mississippi State Athletics. So thanks for having me on. Yeah, happy to help out. Before we uh, sign off officially, do you want to explain to everyone listening uh, why it is that uh, Q Weatherspoon shot your right eye out? <laughs> All right. So here, here's a little story for you. Um, so last Wednesday, which had been February 20th, um, I turned 27 years old. Um, so my wife and I, we went to Athens uh, to watch the Mississippi State Georgia basketball game. Um, my my uncle graciously gave us his uh, Bulldog Club tickets for uh, the the Georgia Bulldog Club. Right. So Thank we were. You, yeah. Uh, thanks, Doc. So we're about six rows up. It was great. Um, ended up with a thrilling victory. Um, which included a um, stuffed animal thrown onto the court. Um, nobody was aware of that um, right. in the stadium, <laughs> which was kind of hilarious. But um, so that was fun. So we go out to eat afterwards at a restaurant. And um, I don't know where else you go out to eat, but we were sitting in a restaurant. And I had my phone on the table. And I got a text message. And my light, you know, from from my phone... Uh, shines and I'm like, oh man, that is really, really bright. <laughs> um, which you would not normally say about your cell phone going off. Uh, you just be like, oh, I got a text message. Uh, so we drive home and everything's fine. Go to sleep, and I wake up the next morning and I am blind in my right eye. <laughs> Jeez. So it's just uh, gone. yeah, it's just completely gone. Um. So I have a, a, a condition called uveitis in my right eye. And until that uh, heals itself with some, some drops and some, some eye drops and some time, I'm, uh, I'm wearing an eye patch, which is kind of, uh, kind of awesome and kind of frustrating at the same time. But uh, yeah, Q Weatherspoon shot my eye out. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I hope you feel better soon as far as that goes. Um, and... Uh, want to thank everyone for tuning in to this episode of the podcast the weekly pessimist presented by running out the clock sports the uh, lakers and pelicans game is on right now and floyd mayweather is sitting courtside and he was text messaging on two phones simultaneously to himself yeah probably so and it reminds me that there are few people in the world few public figures in the world that i dislike more than floyd money mayweather thanks for listening to this episode we'll see you next time here on uh running out the clock sports young sheldon is next see ya